classic. It's just classic Job's heart. You know, it's not about me as if you should do things my way. You alone are God, and I surrender. And that's, Job learned the hard way that God really was God. God really did love him. God, despite everything that he went through, I mean, God even described Job as a righteous man. I mean, he, he had it together, and that's why the enemy was after him. I just want to encourage you, if you're here tonight or you're watching online or listening on the radio as this goes out, just because you're facing radical trials in your life does not mean you failed. I mean, most of us have failed, okay? Don't get me wrong. You have failed. But, but our victory is in Christ. And once we've submitted to Him and we, and we go after Him, you guys, the enemy's going to come after you, just like he did Job. You go after God, you set your heart for righteousness, he's going to come after, the enemy's going to come after you. But we got to remember at the same time, you guys, God's got a plan. He has his hand on us, and we're to do as he's called us to. As we get into, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 14. We left off at verse 33. Uh, the laws for mildew in your home mold in your home, laws for leprous, uh, a leprous house, uh, basically speaking of disease in your home, uh, there's different titles and names put on it, again, mildew, mold, leprosy, but all of that said, God has a plan for it, and here's just a part of his plan, and here's, here's in a sense, uh, a part of your part in his plan. In chapter 14, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, and you can look at that back at the very beginning, this whole portion on leprosy and, and such things. We already talked about uncleanness in chapter 13 as well, but for the cleansing part. God says, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day that, of his cleansing. So God's made provision already for a time of cleansing, a place of purification. He says, he shall be brought, here it is, listen, to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. The priest is the one that's to check it out. Listen, understand, it was the priest part. It was a great part of the priest part. His job to make sure that disease didn't enter and then spread in the camp. That was part of the priest part. And part of our part, as the Lord calls us a royal priesthood, you guys, we are those that serve God as a kingdom of priests unto Christ in God. In God. And we are to be those that are to make sure that, that, that leprosy, that, that sin, doesn't enter and spread in the camp. And the good news is that when it does, not if it does, but when it does, God's given us the, the understanding of, of how we're to deal with it. You know, it, it's amazing. I love it. How are we to deal with it? You know what? We, we take it immediately to our Savior. We take it immediately in chapter 13, verse 1, when we entered into all of this, laws about leprosy. Listen, Moses and Aaron, the Lord spoke to them saying, when a person has this disease on the skin of his body, a swelling an eruption, a rash, a shiny spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, his flesh. Then he shall what? He will be brought to Aaron, the high priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. You guys, what we do when we find sin going on in our lives, personally, or in our homes, you know, seriously, we're to be those that we take it right to Jesus. We take it right to Jesus. And at the same time, you know, we're to, we're to take it to maybe a brother. That The Word tells us that, you know, if you confess your sins, you know, you confess your sins to a brother, James talks about. And that idea of, of you know, like, well, confess my sins to a brother, that would take all day and I'd be bothering brothers all the time. That's not the idea. It's not just every sin we go and confess to a brother, but... There's those sins that the enemy, you know, it's, it's leprous. It gets in there and it, and, it, and it starts to take over. 
There's those sins that maybe confessing it to a brother. What, is it, what does it do to, if you confess your sins to a brother? What does that do to you? It humbles you. Big time. You know? And what does God say about the humble? He lifts them up. You know? And so it's like this victory that we have in our, in our, in our humbling, in our embarrassment. But again, when you take it to a brother who is likened to you, a brother who knows they can sin and they fall short as well, uh, it's not quite as embarrassing. I want to challenge you, if you ever have to address a brother with sin, do it in a way that you don't embarrass him. If you ever have a brother come to you to confess sin, don't, listen, okay, don't do that. Oh my gosh! Oh! You know, have you talked to Master Steve about this? You know? <laughs> you know don't do that. You know? Just, you know, just, just nod and say, you know what? I understand. Maybe you haven't fallen to their same sin, but you've fallen, surely, surely fallen to sin. And so, in chapter 14, we've seen the cleansing of leprosy and what to do after the healing has happened. There needs to be a cleansing. You know, again, in the title of the message, in a sense, basically, you, you have a clean home, but you have a cleansed home. You know, you can, you can clean your house all you want, but only God can cleanse your house. And that's where we dropped off in verse 33, looking at the cleansing of a home. And, and look at verse 33 here real quickly, and, and I'm going to give you a little insight to help us understand more of this. Verse 33, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession... And I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession. Then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, there seems to me to be some case of disease in my house. You know, and, and so you go and you tell the priest. But notice this real quickly. The Lord's speaking to Moses and Aaron, and he's saying, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession... This is something, you know, and we're talking about mold, mildew, disease, and, and, and it's going to be very clear in the stones, in the walls, in the beams of their homes. You, right now, what are they doing? Where are they? Right now, Israel, as they're being given the law, they're, they're camping out. They're in tents. They don't have stones and beams. They don't have... This is speaking to, as it says, the land of Canaan that I'm going to give you for possession. So God already knows. When you come into the land of promise, you're still going to have issues. Listen, when we go, when we speak about Israel, and we'll talk about it coming in as they're heading towards the promised land. Forty years it takes them. Hopefully you get there faster. But the idea is this. The promised land is not a picture, as some will paint it, of heaven ahead or, or, or eternity. Not even. It's a picture, if, if, if anything, it's a picture of, of the victorious Christian life. What God wants for us there. Again, it's a very real picture of Israel as God took them there, His people. But then for we, the church, there's also a picture that can be painted that says this is, this is a type of the church in the victorious Christian life. When you've crossed through the, the Jordan River, you've, you've, you've given up on your... your you're floundering and you're wandering and I'm going to live for Christ that moment, you know? And all of a sudden, what happens? But there's walls and there's battles and there's mold and there's mildew. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's those things in our lives that, that assail us when we're in the midst of, well, the land of Canaan, the promised land. So the promised land, it was promised that there would be full of what? There would be milk and honey and, and grapes the size of grapefruits and all the, you know, just amazing, the promised land. At the same time, it's going to be a place where there's still going to be battles to be fought and victories to be enjoyed. And God has a plan for all of it. And so he says, I'm going to give you this place as a possession and when you get there, look in the midst of verse 34, and I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession. And so God's saying, you know, note here, Mark, I'm going to put a, if I, if you're in that place and I put a case, I put a, um, another translation is a mark of leprous disease, a mark of leprosy. 
I put it, uh, another translation is, and you're in that place, that land I promised you, and I put a spreading mildew in that place in your land. He says, listen, then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest. Interesting real quickly here that God puts a mark. The Lord makes us aware. We're going to see coming up at the end of our text here that there's a, it's, it's all the, a, a swelling, a, a, an itch, a, a, a shiny spot, an eruption to show what is unclean and what is clean. And so here at the same time, the Lord is saying, listen, when I bring you into that place where, that I promised to you, and I show you, I put a mark there, I make you aware that something is wrong. In this case, something is wrong in your home. Before it was something is wrong in your body, it was a spot on your skin, on your forehead, a swelling in that way. But here in this case, it's, you know, and, and not your clothing, you know, we'll address that, and we have some already. But this is this is in your home. This is in your home. It's invaded and it's spreading. You guys, again, as we've noted, leprosy, mold, mildew, all these types of sin in the Bible. But I tell you, such perfect types, such just clear types and pictures of sin, and the invading and the 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 spreading in our lives personally, and at the same times, as we see here in our homes eventually, even again, getting into the good things that God has given us, i.e. Canaan. They're in Canaan. They're in the land of promise. Where the first thing they see as they come into the land of promise as they enter into, there is Jericho before them with great walls. And then after that, there's, there's many wars and there's giants. And again, there's, there's more. There's mildew. There's more. There's things that just, you think you're safe from the enemy. And all of a sudden, the enemy is, is, not, is, is not just in your home. It is your home, as we see here. And, and God's got this plan for all of it. And the good news as well, as we addressed last week, that God's eyes were on every sacrifice that was made because it pictured and it pointed to Jesus. You guys, God's eyes are on us in all these trials and all these struggles with life in the promised land. This life in Christ that we have, where we're promised victory, but we're going to have battles. And again, the words are there, he shall go and tell the priest. Seems to me there's some case of a disease in my house. So again, surely an embarrassing, you know, moment to degree situation, humbling, you know, but, but the cool, neat thing about this, one of many, is that, that God already sees it. God already, already sees it, and, and God has, has exposed it so that your house can be made clean. Listen, this evening, last Sunday, this morning, when you're reading your Bible, hopefully, or sometime throughout the day and listening to the radio, God is... He's faithful to say, hey, you know what? That itch, it's going to spread. You know, that swelling, it's going to erupt. You know, it's a, I mean, God warns us all along the way. And he tells us, you know, along the way, humble yourself. You need to talk to the priest. And then in verse 36, the priest shall command that the, the empty house, okay, get that house, or to the, they empty the house, before the priest goes in to examine the disease, lest all that is in the house be declared unclean. And so basically, the idea here is, you be discerning first. You will do all that you can do if you have mold in your home or whatever. You, you start to clean best you can first. But at the same time, you know, you know you need to get, you know, a restoration. You know, you need to get somebody in there that knows what they're doing more than you. If you've ever watched any of those home shows, it's like, oh, we're... We're remodeling this. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Oh, hey, hey, I hate to call you but and tell you, but you've got mold. We found mold. Yeah, it's going to cost you thousands, thousands, yeah. No, I can't do it. we got to call in a professional. I mean, that's what they do, right? You know what? Because that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. But there's a cure. You guys, there's a cure. And I'm telling you, it is so cool. One of the things I just thought of this evening, right before we headed out of the house, Hopefully I'll remember it at the end as we close this up. But, but, uh, but so God says, listen, you know, you need to take care of things best you can, but you need to get the priest in there. And afterwards, 
key afterwards, after you've done all that you, you can, your part, the priest shall go in to see the house, and he shall examine the disease, and if the disease in the walls of the house is, is greenish, or it has reddish spots, and if it appears to be deeper than the surface, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door and of the house, and he shall shut up the house for seven days. And the priest shall come, and again on the seventh day he shall look. And if the disease is spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take out the stones in which the disease are, and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around. The plaster they shall scrape, they shall take away and pour out in an unclean place outside the city. And then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones. And he shall take other plaster and plaster the house. So no mixing up old plaster, no cleaning up the old stones. This, there's a time and there's a place to, to, to make things new. And, and note in this, back in verse 37, where it says that the priest is going to examine it and if at the end of verse 37 in my translation here, if it appears to be deeper than the surface, okay? We know that the leprosy, in this case mildew, mold, whatever the case may be, we know it's a picture and it's a type of sin. Let me tell you right now, it's deeper than the surface. If you're seeing it, more often than not, I'm thinking, you know, if sin is present and you see it, it's most always deeper than the surface. And, and I think that's a good thing for us to understand. You know, they talk about getting to the root of the issue, you know. It's not, it's not so much the, the sin that you see, but it's the sin that, that set the stage for that sin to begin. And, and I think so many times that's the way we need to see it. We need to look. We need to look deeper than the surface. You clean the surface, you know what? You come back, there you got mold again. You got sin again, and it, and it spread to other areas now, and, and it's, it's leprous. It's like that. And you guys, again, listen, Matthew Henry said of this, he said, for, for masters of homes, for masters of families, at the very first appearance of sin in your home, you should treat it like gangrene. You remove it completely at any cost. You remove it. You guys, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be those that are, are they, people say, oh, don't be a sin sniffer. No, you know what? You need to be a sin sniffer. First in your own life, so that you can remove that plank of sin from your life, so that then you can go and find the splinter of mold in your brother's eye. You guys, because you are your brother's keeper. People are, well, I'm, am I my brother's keeper? You know, I'm not my brother's keeper. No, you are your brother's keeper. Everything about us in, in the life in Christ is about our brothers, you know, if it's not about God, if it's addressed in the scripture, there's so much, if it's not about our relationship with God and how we live with Him, it's about our relationship with one another, with our brothers, and how we're to love them, and how we're to encourage them, and, and lift them up, and challenge them, and at the same time, to, to, to look and to inspect with love, like we talked about on Sunday, to with love look and see if, if we can find, if there's something that needs to be removed, if there's, listen, if there's a danger to your brother's home, you got to address it. And sometimes your brother won't accept it when you address it. And sometimes your brother won't feel so much like a brother after you, after you address it. But, but again, that's the call to us in our lives. And, and I think in this case here as well, again, if we would do it in our own homes first, you guys, we would have, well, we would have a, well, we'd have a clean home. We'd have a home that others could say, you know what? I want a house like yours. I want a house like that. I want a life that, that's, that, that's, that's cleansed. Not perfect. Like we talked about, we can see the scars from your past boils. We can see the scars from, from the, the past leprosy in your life. Those scars are there, but, but they're healed. And, and, it, and it, it gives hope to others that their, their, their sores and their hurts and their pains can be healed. In Job 22... Verse 23. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tents. Again, you don't take the old stones and clean them up and bring them back. 
You don't take the old plaster, mix it up fresh, and, and spread it again. But you remove unrighteousness. Another translation there is injustice. You remove it far from your tents. And you can think, well, wait a minute. Well, who said that? Was that Job? I mean, it's in Job, but was it Job? Because Job, he spoke pretty well, but his friends were pretty mixed up. And I'll tell you, this was one of his friends. It was one of his mixed up friends. This was Eliphaz, the, the Temanite. And he had, is giving his counsel to Job. And it is in, verse, in chapter 22. So it is deep into the discussion. And really, it's like you've heard me talk about often. It's, you know, you know when you're counseling someone, don't go shooting from the hip. Don't just go shooting from your lips. Oh, well, that's what I think, you know, what I feel. And, you know, sounds like wisdom, you know. Condemnation, maybe, you know, but, but wisdom, you know, no. Here's the thing. This was one of his mixed up friends. And, and note here, too, if you remember when Job was there and he's, he's lost everything and he's sitting there in sackcloth and ashes and his friends show up. And for three days, they just sat with him and wept. They sat together with him and wept. Those are friends, man. Those are friends. Listen, when you're dealing with someone that's going through some hard time, you know, blessed are those who mourn. You know, learn to be able to weep with those who weep, you know. And, 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 just, and sometimes you don't need to have come up wise, with wise counsel. You know, if God truly gives you counsel, then give counsel. But if God doesn't give you counsel, then, you know, you'll probably say some things that are good, like Eliphaz does but some things that are not. In the beginning of, of chapter 22, he says, Can a man be profitable to God? Surely he who is wise is, is profitable to himself, but it, can he be profitable to God? Is there any pleasure to the Almighty if you are right? Or is it gain to Him if you make your ways blameless? You know, does it really affect God, you know, my life and my righteousness? And did, can I please Him? You know, listen, let me tell you. Let me answer that for you. You bet you can. You can please Him, and you should please Him. In Re Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we see that we were created for His pleasure. You guys, and we can please Him. I mean, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. I mean, what, do you, what, do you, what does bless mean, remember? Oh, how happy. It's like, make God happy. I mean, love Him. Make, if, if we can grieve Him, at Ephesians 4, 30, surely we can bring him pleasure as well. And so, I mean, he says, listen to this, he says, it is for your fear of him that he reproves you. It, it is, it, he, and he enters into judgment now with you. Is it not your evil that is abundant? Is there no end to your iniquities? And so, he's come to the place where now he's looking at Job and saying, this is because of sin in your life. And he, it's like, basically, Job was, he was a righteous man, we know that. And, and as men do, this, this must be it. You know, this is God's punishment. This is like the makings of one of the first prosperity teachers, you know, of all time. You know, it's like, you know, if you were, if you were living well, then God would be blessing you, surely. No, Job was a righteous man, the most righteous man in all the land. And he knew it later. He would even say it. He says, listen, he knows the way that I love this in chapter 23, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. I praise God for the times I can say that. I can't always say that. But I praise God for the times that when I have been accused wrongly or something has happened, that I can say, you know what, I, I know God knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I, I'll come out as gold. I might not look so shiny here, but in heaven I'm going to shine. And Just before that, these lines, you know, you, I think I should write a song. When he is working, I don't behold him. I, I don't perceive him and I don't see him. You know? I mean, it was, wouldn't that be a great song? You know, something, you know? Even when I don't see it, you know, he's working. Even when I don't perceive him, you know, he turns, to, turns my right hand. He's there. You guys, the words that Eliphaz said there in verse 23 it proceeded with this and then we'll come back to the Leviticus text. Listen, in verse 21 actually, he says agree with God and be at peace. So many times I think that's, that's true. That's what we need to do. Just agree with God. You know, I'm a sinner. I've, I've done wrong. 
in, in, in my case, maybe not in Joe's, but in our case so many times, agree with God, be at peace, confess. Therefore, good may come. Receive instruction from His mouth. Lay up His words in your heart. Isn't that what we're to do? I mean, He's got some good stuff here. And then if you return to the Almighty, you will surely be built up. And you guys, that's what God will do. It doesn't mean that you won't have some aches and pains along the way in Canaan. But you return and you'll be built up. And if you remove unrighteousness from your tents. You guys, God doesn't want us again. He wants, there's some good counsel here. God doesn't want us to, to, to just set things outside the tent. He wants them outside the city. He wants them outside to the place that is unclean, where unclean things go. Too many times I think we find ourselves in a place where, where we're trying to fix what, what's broken that God says, no, that, that you know, surely has to die. And so look at verse 43. And I want you to note here first too, you know, three things in this is that first God reveals the problem and then he tells them, tell the priest. Once you see it, once it's been revealed, tell the priest. And then number three, do what God reveals to the priest that he tells he needs to be done. I think that's one of the most important things. Listen, if, if someone gives you counsel, a brother who's a, 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 a true brother in Christ, and they give you good godly counsel, I mean, you've seen it. It's been revealed to you. And then, you know, and then you, you, you go and you tell someone, you tell a brother, you tell a priest of God, you know, in a sense, and your pastor even. And then they give you some good advice, biblical, good biblical advice. Do what they do what they've said. Do what the Bible says. Do what God has spoken. Because things will surely get worse. And that's what we see what happens here. Look at verse 43. If the disease breaks out again in the house, after he has taken out the stones and scraped the house and plastered it, I mean, yeah, we got all the stones out, we scraped it out, replastered. Then the priest shall go and he'll look. And if the disease has spread in the house, it is a persistent leprous disease in the house and it is unclean. And so again, all the more reason, all the more reason to first, you know, first, first off, don't touch the unclean thing as the word tells us. Need, we are to be those that, that back in chapter 10 we saw it, that to, are to learn to discern between what is clean and what is unclean. Remember? The Lord spoke directly, only time to Aaron that he spoke directly. He said, drink no wine or strong drink. You or your sons with you when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be, a, and remember his two sons, uh, Nadab and Abihu, had just died before this. they gone in probably drinking, it seems implied there. It shall be a statute forever through all your generations. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of all Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken them by Moses. And so you tell a brother, and he tells you, well, here's something that I found in the Word, and, and as, as you, you're, you've cleaned your house, you, you find someone that you know knows the difference between the clean and the unclean. You see their life, and you can, you can see mostly clean. And so, you know, they're not going to find anybody that, that's perfect. There's no Mr. Clean. You know, Jesus is the only Mr. Clean that ever was and ever will be. The only one that wears, can wear white right now, you know, except for us in Christ. But he comes and he, and he gives you wisdom, a, a brother, a friend. You guys were to do it, what is spoken. Because the disease, will, the disease will spread in the house. So first thing, don't touch the unclean thing. Second thing is is when, the, when you have touched it or someone has brought it into your home. Maybe you didn't bring it into your home, but someone else has. Purge out all the leaven. Purge out all the leaven. If the Lord has shown you things that need to go, what do you do? You clean house. You clean house. You get rid of it. You deal with what God has put in front of you. He said, deal with it. Be done with it. If your right hand, listen, if your right hand causes you to sin, seems like Jesus said this, right? Cut it off. Throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. And I look at that and I think I remember, you know, 
times in my life where I was thinking about myself growing up in my parents' home and how they might have been better off to, 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 to send me out, I almost think, you know? Then, then, my, then my, my sin infect the home. You know, I mean, to, to some degree at least, you know, their leniency led to my continuing in, in some of my sin. I can't tell you if they would have been a little bit stricter and, and staunch in their, their decisions and things that they had done that uh, I would have not continued and gone forward and, and, and followed through with some of the things that I did back then. But I know that because of those things that I continued in, that my sister, you know, followed in some of those same areas. You know, she thought her brother Steve was cool. <laughs> now she knows better. <laughs> and now she thinks I'm pretty cool. You know, I mean, and, and uh, I mean, you guys, things can be fixed, but... Again, Jesus, when he said that, he wasn't actually saying, hey, pluck out your eye if it causes you to sin. He, did, he said it. Throw it away. He didn't mean, hey, pluck out your eye. He's saying, you know, he's go, go to the extreme. He's saying, you need to go to extreme measures when it comes to extreme sin in your life. The picture is there. Better to lose one of your members, you know, than your whole body going to hell. And so... Again, I look and I think, gosh, you know, God has, has a, a powerful message for us in this when it comes to our homes. Again, it's talking about mold and mildew, uh, but it's speaking to sin very clearly. Persistent sin in your house. Making it unclean. Clean house. And then he says in verse 45, he shall break down the house, Right? It's, you know, it's spread. We've, we've, we've replaced, we've put other stones in. We've put new plaster in. But you know what? It, it's come back. And it's come back with a vengeance. So he says, here's what you do. Verse 45, you break down the house. The whole house. You tear down the stones. It's timber. All the plaster of the whole house. And he carries them out of the city to an unclean place. You guys, again, better to lose your, your house than your family. Watch your family die. I mean, you could have mold or mildew in your house. And you're like, ah, well, we can live here still. Next thing you know, <coughs> excuse me. Next thing you know, you know, it's not just coughing something, but it's coughing something up. It's, it's your, people all of a sudden in a place where, where mold, you know, mold can kill you. Mold can kill you. That's again, is why it's such a perfect picture of sin in our lives. Sin in your home. Listen, it can take out your family. In Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Listen, you probably know it already. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And though it costs all you have, get wisdom. Though it costs you everything, you guys, it might cost, I mean, better to to save your house, I mean, better to save your family and lose your house than to save your house and lose your family. And that's the way that it works. Again, you take the stones, you take the timber, you take the plaster, you take the house apart. I mean, I think sometimes that's what people need to do, really. I mean, not physically take their house apart, but, but mentally, with God's help and the Holy Spirit's guidance, go through their house and remove all the leaven. You know, I mean, it's like, ask the Lord. Lord, go to the priest, you know. Bring, invite the high priest, your high priest, the our King Jesus. Invite him. If you say he's the master of your home, invite him in and say, Lord, show me what needs to go. And walk through your house, room by room. Listen, child by child, looking at their house. I mean, what is it where Peter tells us that we are a spiritual house? You know, your children, they're called to, to grow to be spiritual men and, and women of God. And spiritual house, go through your house. Look at every area. Look at yourself. Look at your wife. You guys, those things, what needs to change? Cry out to God. I mean, that was the thing. And, you know, and, and maybe, maybe even again, Go and tell a priest, confess to a brother, hey, there seems to be some disease in my house, man. There's something, I need prayer. 
I, I need, can you, can you come and, and walk through with me to look and see what maybe needs to be done in my house? Listen, and, and, and carry them out. Get them out of the city. Get, get whatever it is, the stones, the timber, the plaster, whatever there is that makes up your home, remove it completely. Carry them out. In Jeremiah uh, 51, I love it. In Jeremiah 51, speaking of Babylon, the Lord says, I am, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord. I am against you. You who destroys the whole earth, I will stretch out my hand against you. You know, you, he, that, that mildew that was Babylon, that, that, that leprous nation that, that was bringing down every other nation. He says, I'll stretch out my hand against you and I will roll you down from the crags and I will make you into a burnt mountain. In other words, I'm going to take you outside the city. You know, meet me out back. I'm going to take care of you to that unclean place. And so then, and then he says this, verse 26, No stone shall be taken from you for a corner. No stone will be taken for a part of your foundation. But you shall be a perpetual waste, declares the Lord. You know, what God is, re what God is going to remove when it comes to Babylon, in a sense, that picture of the world in our lives, in our homes, whatever, he says, you don't, you don't save anything. You know, no, no stone that's taken from you is going to be taken for a cornerstone anywhere. No stone for a part of any foundation. When Jesus Christ returns with his church and, 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 and builds new Jerusalem and there is a, a, a foundation there in that new temple, it will not have anything that will have come from this world. It won't be stuff of this world. It won't be, Jesus isn't going to say, oh, well, here, we'll take from this building that was of the world and we'll, we can rebuild with this. We can use this. And my, this. God's not going to take parts of the world to put into his temple. You know, that again is why the Lord says, when we go into the new heavens and the new earth after the millennial kingdom, it says, behold, I make all things new. God's not going to take, the old things are going to pass away. All the world will be rolled up like a scroll and done. God said, I'm not using anything that was from before. Everything, everything's going to be new. I mean, you think about that. I mean, it's like this, this whole new, we, I mean, we read about creation in Genesis chapter 1 and, and 2, and you guys, we're, we're going to see a recreation that's even better than the first creation in the, in the second creation, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to get to see so that's how he did it. He did just speak and it was. You know, I mean, it's going to be amazing. But listen, important words. No stone is taken and used again. No stone for a cornerstone, that which is important. There'll be nothing important that'll come from, from the world and there shouldn't be in our lives or, or foundation. But I was thinking it as well, how, how prone we are and can be to try to take and restore those things that God has said no more. To take, to take it all and dismantle it completely is what the Lord has said. To, to take and put it outside the camp. We're so prone to, to think of how can we restore and how can we use, you know, you know that, that which God has called sin, how can I make it okay in my life? It's, 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 it's what we do. But again, if we look at the, the pictures and the types here, they're perfect for us. It's to be gone and no more. And so, in verse 16, it's carried out of the city, the whole house, stones, timber, plaster, everything. You know, e e e beep, 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 mm -hmm. dump, dump it, you know. In verse 46, I'm sorry, did I say 16? 40, verse 46, Moreover, whoever enters the house while it is shut up shall be unclean. And... It'll be unclean until evening. And whoever sleeps in the house shall wash his clothes. And whoever eats in the house shall wash his clothes. And, and basically, you know, restoration, when I look at it this way and think about it, restoration uh, can be dangerous. Those that are there entering the house when it's shut up and it's unclean and, 
and and they they got they're gonna head out. You're gonna wash your clothes. Somebody's sleeping there. I don't know why you would want to sleep there when God's saying tear it down and there's mold in the walls. But you know what the the law is to wash. Whoever eats in the house, wash, get clean. And and here's the warning. Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six. Oops. Oops. There we go. All right. I guess I didn't mark it. In Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, whoops. There we go. Hold on a sec. I know I said whoops again. Just bear with me. One sec. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. I was looking at chapter 5, no wonder. Oh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. That can't be right either. That's not right. <laughs> Children, obey your parents. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can remember here. All right. Okay, there you go. It's right before Ephesians, Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. If anyone is caught with mildew, you, it says with any transgression, okay. If anyone is caught in any transgression, mildew, blight, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Again, you, don't, you, you go kindly, you go gently. But then he writes this, Paul says, but keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Keep watch on yourself. Watch over yourself when you're trying to help your brother out, to get him out of his sin. You guys, it's a dangerous place. I was talking with a guy a while back, was dealing with a friend and trying to help him, you know, probably 15 years ago or so, and, and was trying to help him with his uh, issue with pornography that he had. And as he knew his brother had a problem. His brother's wife had made it evident that he had a problem. And, you know, and there's a few people that knew. And so this one brother was going to help him be accountable. And the one brother told the other brother how he snuck around and was looking at pornography so that his wife wouldn't know. And so this guy learned that loophole and started to do it. And then he told me. I'm like, don't tell me. I don't want to know that. I don't want you to listen. I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that. And then, and here's the thing. Then he got found out. Listen, your sin will find you out. I mean, and that doesn't just go for, for that area. I'm going to help my brother. Yeah, he's hanging out at the bar. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, go, I'm going to go find him. I'm going out to find him. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to have, I'm just going to have, sit down, have one. He's sitting at the bar. I'm going to sit down with him. Well, this is awkward. What can I get you? Oh, nothing. Oh, come on, you got to have something. You're sitting at the bar. Oh, okay, give me a beer. The next thing you know, I mean, who knows how it goes, but we need to be so careful. You guys, we need to get things out and get them out completely. We need to be careful to wash ourselves and keep ourselves clean, clean and cleansed. But here it is, verse 48. Here it is, good news. The priest comes and he looks and the disease is not spread. The house is clean, and after the house is plastered, the priest shall announce, the house is clean, and the disease is healed. Here it is, and again, verse 49, we saw this last week, I love this, we talked about it on Sunday morning as well, when we take, took communion together. And for the cleansing of the, the house, he shall take, here it is, two small birds with cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And, and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel. I mean, he kills one of the birds in an earthenware vessel. And as he does this, again, this is awesome. Hold on a sec. Okay. As he kills the one bird in the earthenware vessel with fresh water there, uh, he takes... And he takes the, uh, verse 51, 
he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn along with the live bird and dip them in the blood of the bird that was killed in the fresh water in the earthenware vessel and sprinkle the house seven times. And thus he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the fresh water with the blood in it and with the live bird and with the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn. And he shall let the live bird go out of the city into the open country and he shall make atonement for the house and it shall be clean. You guys, this is so cool because again, and, and so some of you, you heard it last Wednesday night, then you heard it Sunday morning, and now you're hearing it again. And this is good. It's good that you, you've already know this. You've already heard this, like Paul has said, and like Peter would say as well. But it's good that I remind you that you hear it again. You know why? Because you can learn this. This is one of those places that you can take someone to. And so this is amazing. Look at this. Here's this one, this, this bird that, that's, that's, that's a, a, a citizen of heaven. One from heaven. One that's come down from heaven, from the heavens. And, and this bird has been killed in an earthenware vessel. And so if you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter three, or chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. You guys, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're, we're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always carrying around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the life of that, that bird that was, was killed for us, that one from heaven, might be manifested in our mortal flesh. You guys, the translation that I have here and, and quite a few others say we have this treasure in jars of clay. The translation from the New American Standard from New King James Version, I believe as well, is we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that this all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It's not from us. It's because of, it's because of these earthen vessels that we live in. They show us how weak we are, but we understand as well in Leviticus 14 that it was an earthen vessel. Who was it that, that took on flesh and became a man. Who was it that came from the heavens, from heaven, became a man, took on flesh, an earthen vessel for his body? It was Jesus Christ. And you look at what happens here, well, that, that, then that, that one that was from heaven that has taken on this, this earthen vessel, a body of a man, he was killed. And and, and, then, and then there's blood and water there. And if you remember when Jesus was crucified, it was blood and water that came out from his side when he was pierced. We're saved by the blood and we're saved by the water. At the same time, listen, then he is, this is, he's taken, this, or this bird is taken, and where it says, with cedar wood. Another translation of that can be rendered that tied to cedar wood, fixed to cedar wood, with scarlet yarn and hyssop. And you, and you think again, the, the scarlet yarn being that picture of the scarlet thread of redemption that you see all throughout the, the Bible. And if you haven't, and they don't even know if they make them anymore, but the Open Bible Study Bible, one of the first Bibles that ever, study Bibles that ever came out back in the, in the 90s, I think it was, maybe the early, mid-80s. But the Open Bible Study Bible, in that it has... A, a section in the beginning of it called the Scarlet Thread of Redemption, and it's awesome. It goes through all those places that you see that thread of scarlet, that, that picture of blood shed for redemption all throughout the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus Christ. And here again we see it. This, this one from heaven with a, you know, in an earthen vessel there tied to cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And why hyssop again? I mean, scarlet, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, we see. And we see hyssop there. We talked about it last week in Exodus chapter 12. It was hyssop, verse 22 of Exodus 12, where they took hyssop and they dipped the hyssop into the blood of the lamb and then they spread it over the doorpost of the home, you know. And, and that beautiful picture of covered, the home, this home is covered by the blood. 
and, and death would pass by. At the same time, in John 19, verse 28, we see where Jesus was there on the cross and he was crucified and, and, and he said, I thirst, and they raised up to him a hyssop branch with, with sour wine on it. And then, of course, in Psalm 51, verse 7, where the psalmist David, after being busted in his sin for the, the murder of Uriah and adultery as a king, adultery, busted for adultery as a king, and, and, and he says, as he's busted, he says, you know, purge me with hyssop that I may be clean. You guys, I, I can't think that David didn't know the word, and, and he, he went right back here to this, these places where we've seen that, that cleansing of the one who is leprous. I mean, he knew his sin was as, as leprosy, and we see that earlier on, how his body wastes away. And the pictures that he paints, they could be identified as even leprous. Though he wasn't, inside he was, because of his sin, the way that he felt. And so again, killed in this earthenware vessel. And then, of course, along with the live bird, as we said, then dipped in the blood that was killed in the, in the fresh water and sprinkling the house seven times. But the live bird then, with the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn, as it's dipped into that, he is set free to go out into the open country. And now, we mentioned last week that that's, that live bird is a, is a beautiful picture of us. And there's some that paint it that way, and I think you can. But I think you can also make a case for it. As I was looking at this today a second time, it's always good you start to look at things a second and a third and fourth time, and the scripture always opens up even more. But it's almost like, hey, there's this picture of Jesus, you know, that, 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 that one that was from heaven that was placed in the earthen vessel and, and killed. And, and, he, and he took there on the cross, that cedar representing the cross, with the scarlet that bound him there, the blood that was shed, and, and the hyssop and all. You look at that, and, and it's a beautiful picture as well, not just of the death of Christ, but at the same time of his resurrection. The other bird representing maybe a resurrected Savior. Maybe, maybe one that is set free out into the open country. To go out of the city, let the other bird fly, you know, and as Jesus would ascend, you know. And, and so I, I read one commentator, Matthew Henry as well, that, that talked about that and, and painted a beautiful picture. But I don't know, does it represent Jesus? Does it represent us? But didn't he say that you shall be with me? That we're going to join him, you guys? Because he's been resurrected, we have resurrection. All these pictures again pointing, it could be both. But again, all of it clearly pointing to Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, we're told, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You guys, Christ suffered once for our sins, the, the clean, we could say, for the unclean. That he might bring us to God. That's what it's all about. It's about having a clean house. It's about having a clean home. Putting to death in the flesh uh, those things that are of, of our life and, but being made alive in the Spirit. You guys, when I look at this, as we close this up here, again, uh, all pointing to Jesus. Verse 54. This is the law for any case of leprous, leprous disease. And he addresses both the body and, and the home and, and, and what you wear, what covers you. It's the law. This is God's plan for any case of leprous disease. For an itch. Uh, for an itch. It's just an itch. Oh, it's okay. I just got an itch. For leprous disease in a garment or in a house, it can take a whole house. What's, what, what started as an itch can infect a whole house. And for a swelling, or here it is, or an eruption, this is sounding gross. I mean, it's like, this is like, or here it is, or a shiny spot. This is the law for all these things. The itch, the swelling, the garment, the, the eruption, the shiny spot. Those things are all there. God brings those things to us to show, hey, something's unclean. 
or it is clean. This is the law for leprous disease. You guys, the idea here again, God shows us, He reveals to us so clearly. You guys, with sin is present, it always, almost always goes deeper than the surface. And so God reveals to us, He shows us a shiny spot. There's something that, that's there in your life that you can't miss it. You know, this is not shiny in the good way. This is that way that you just wish people couldn't see, but it just, it, it shines. It's not like your righteousness shines like the noonday sun. It's, it's like your sin is just like blinding. Or an itch. You know, they talk about, oh, I just got that itch for something, you know. It's like, no, you know, no, no. You guys, the itch will take you out. The shiny spot, those things are there. God brings them to reveal, you know, what the thing, as things start small like sin. It's to show us that, you know what, there's something unclean. There's something that, that needs to be dealt with. There's something that, that surely will swell that eventually will erupt. And in this case of leprosy, it kills. In the case of mildew, it destroys a whole home. So it, it's, I think it's better to, to understand as God reveals and you've seen than do what He says before our homes are destroyed. And we've all seen it before. We know people with ministries that have been destroyed because of sin. And you guys, God says, identify it. Identify it. And do what? And, and come to me. Run. Run to me. Run to him before you're ruined before him. In chapter 13, again, verse 1. We read it just a moment ago. This is the law. When a person has a skin on his body, a swelling, an eruption, a spot, turns into leprosy, disease of the skin on his body, on his flesh, then he shall, what? Come to Jesus. Be brought to the high priest. Be brought to Aaron. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, we'll close up with this. We talked about this on Sunday. In Colossians 3, one of those 316 verses. I love it. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I mean, remember he said in, in our study on Sunday, he was telling those, those priests and those that were there questioning him, upset because Jesus was, you know, revealing his deity and they didn't like it. And he said, the word of Christ doesn't dwell in you. I mean, the word, the word of God doesn't dwell in you. He told them straight out, you guys, you, you guys, you study this stuff. This is your life. But the word of God, you might know the word of God, but it doesn't dwell in you. You guys, and what's been offered to us? The word of Christ to dwell in you and richly. Guys, this is the answer. He says in verse 12, put on as God's chosen ones. As God's chosen ones, then put on, he says, holiness and beloved you are. Listen, put on compassion and hearts. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another because you're chosen ones. Bear with one another. If you got to complain against somebody because you're a chosen one, forgive each other. As the Lord's forgiven you, because you're a chosen one, you must also forgive. Above all, because you're a chosen one, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And because you are a chosen one, listen carefully, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. You guys, you guys, we need to, I mean, oh, I don't have peace in my life. It's like, you need to allow the peace of God to, to rule in your life. You need to allow the peace of Christ to, to have His rule. How do you do that? You know what? Being in the Word. You let, you let, here it is. Here's, how does it all work? You let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It doesn't say it's just going to happen. No, you need to, you need to allow it to happen. You have, you have to make way for that, that. You need to put on as God's chosen ones the word of Christ and dwell richly in it. You guys, to put on the word of Christ, listen, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. 
It's you, to put on the Word of Christ. It is, is it, to put Christ in, to dwelling in you at the forefront. The Word richly there. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way that it happens. I mean, that's why those guys could know their Bibles, know the Word, but, but the Word didn't dwell in them. The, it's, a, it's an indwelling work of the Spirit that brings the richness of the Word of Christ dwelling in us. It's, it's those two working together, the Word of the, and the Spirit together. And you guys, and here's what it is. It is protection for your home. Okay? It's protection for you and protection for your home. How is that? Well, listen, here, this is just interesting. Closing note from Jennifer, our daughter. Okay? It isn't from her, but it's just a little story. Years ago, I don't know how many, four or five years ago, some, Jennifer had a roommate, and, uh, and, and she, her roommate was into selling essential oils, which I thought, snake oil, you know, and then Jen started selling it too, and I thought, oh my gosh, my daughter's selling snake oil, and then I realized, hey, you know, some of those essential oils, they really work. And this is not an infomercial, by the way, you know, for doTERRA or whatever, but that's what they were doing. And, and Jen was into it. She was doing well. This other gal, her friend, was really into it. I mean, and, and it worked. And so, but here's the thing. She was so into it that in every room in her home, just about, she had one of those, what do they call them? What? Diffuser. Diffusers. Confusers, you know. They had one of those diffuser things. They really diffused the oils out into the room, right? Well, it turns out, they had a mold issue. They had mold in their bathroom and, and, and it was bad and, and, they, and they, they had to bring in a restoration, you know. They had to call on professionals, you know, to in this house that they were renting, I believe. And this is not perfect, but close. And they came in and they opened up the wall and the shower like you got to get out of here you can't be in here you guys can't live in here we got to close this all off tape it all off and plastic whatever that whole thing that they do uh, because there was so much mold but when they did a reading with their little moldometer you know <laughs> you don't laugh that's what it's called look it up <laughs> google amazon i want to buy a moldometer you know and, but when they checked it out for reading, there was hardly a blip. It was like, how can this be? There's so much mold. They'd never seen it before. There's so much mold. Yet, yet there was, there was, you know, there was no effect in the home. You know why? Because there was oil everywhere. The diffusers, again, put out the, the oil in all of these rooms and, and their gas just kind of attached to the, to the mold and, Know, and, and protect the oil protected them. You know, that's the only explanation they had. The only explanation. And and all that to say, hey, not run out and buy yourself a diffuser and some oils, but but bow your head and bow your heart in the word of Christ and let Christ dwell richly in you by his spirit, you guys, and 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 place the oil of gladness, his spirit over your home dwell richly in you? You guys, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like opening up the Word and God speaking to your heart, challenging you and changing you from glory to glory. That's His plan. Because we're living in Canaan to degree. We're in the promised land. We have so many promises that we have that are yes and amen in Christ. But we also have the promise that in this world you will have tribulation. There will be giants, there will be battles, there will be wars, and there will be more. There will be mildew at times. There will be things that get into your home. You guys, we need the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That's the place of safety. When He shows you, when He makes it clear by itch or by spot, by swelling or, Lord forbid, eruption, <laughs> you know what? Run to Jesus. You run to Jesus. And, and he'll take care of you. Jesus spoke to his disciples in John 15, 3. He says, you are already clean by my word that I have spoken to you. 
and he says, abide in me. Dwell in me. You're already, you're already made clean by the word that I have spoken to you. And I encourage you, he says, you know, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to dwell in me. Because that's his plan, you guys. And next week, actually not next week, but soon coming, we won't have this next week. Uh, if you look ahead, laws about bodily discharges, what everybody's been waiting for, I know. Uh, so read ahead. <laughs> Be disgusted together. Uh, but, but God takes care of it all. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you have a plan for the worst of the worst, as we've already seen here with the walls of the homes being taken down. Lord, uh, show us what needs to be taken down. Show us what needs, God, for real. God, show us, show me in, in my life, in our church, whatever, whatever needs to be taken down and removed shaken and stirred and, and, and shattered and torn and taken out to the, to the dump in our lives, God, show us and reveal to us so that we might be a clean vessel, that we might, in these jars of clay, Lord, see you move mightily. Lord, you gave us the example. You came and you took on the body of a man and, and, and you walked in, in all that was there that was weakness, but you walked as a man in the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. You've shown us, you've shown us, God, how to live the victorious life in this world. Attached to the Father, Father in Heaven, Lord. Uh, anointed by your Spirit. And so, Lord, come and do that work in us. Fill us and guide us and direct us and lead us, Lord. And, Lord, abide, dwell. Lord, deeply in us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen.